Hello. Unfortunately, we've had another couple of people test positive for COVID in our congregation, and so we have another few days where we had to suspend services in accordance with our state health department guidelines. But hopefully, then we have another opportunity for a brief, again, hopefully brief lesson this week on our video services that help to facilitate our families that are worshiping from home and anyone else out there who happens to find these videos. Since it was just a two or three weeks ago that we had another one of these situations, I'm going to go ahead and connect off of that lesson a little bit into this one. And in that previous video lesson, we talked about how there are some things that are at least originally unique to Christianity and that are both requirements and characteristics of true New Testament Christianity. These things include such things as biblical faith, scriptural worship, a living hope, and the characteristic and requirement that we talked about last time, which was love and its outgrowth, which is forgiveness. Now, in this lesson, we're going to discuss another one of those things that are characteristic and a requirement to truly be New Testament Christians. And hopefully, even though this video lesson will be short, it'll give us enough to make the overall point and to hopefully motivate us to dig into this ourselves in our own studies. Our topic today is faithful obedience to the Lord's Word, the Gospel. I have often heard it said, especially by those I have studied with from certain denominations or by the teachers from those denominations, that we don't have to do anything to please the Lord. And they say it in various ways. They'll say, He did it all on the cross and all we have to do is believe. Or they'll say, that if the Lord does require anything of us, that his death wasn't really enough. Or they'll say that love is all you really need in addition to belief. And if you love the Lord enough, he loves you enough to where nothing else is actually required. And I've even been told that we're trying to earn our salvation if we think that anything at all active is required of the Christian. Now, I really and honestly don't mean to sound judgmental or condescending, but when I hear such things, I wonder how much of the Bible people who say them have actually read. The fact is, God has always commanded obedience from his people. Some form of active, active obedience has always been the way he has interacted with his people. Whether it was not eating of the one forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden, or whether it was building a giant boat to prepare for the flood, or whether it was all the complicated worship and sacrifice system of the old law of Moses, or whether it was the many directly commanded and direct examples of things we are told to do in the New Testament. The reality is, if belief or even an emotional inward response to the Lord was enough, then we have about 22 or 23 too many books in the New Testament. Do you, know, do you want to not know what I mean? Well, every single book of, after the Gospels is written in some form or fashion with nearly on every major section of it in quite honestly, in most forms of the Bible and the way it's printed today, in large print in many cases, and nearly every page, if not every couple of pages, there is some command or required example or corrective teaching to those who are not following the things they have been taught in person that is given to us from Acts through the book of Revelation, with the possible exception of the short letter of Philemon. But even in the other short letters, like 2nd and 3rd John and Jude, there are those direct commands. But even in Philemon, Paul says, to paraphrase, that I could command you to do what I'm writing this letter to encourage you to do, but I basically trust you enough that just me writing this to encourage you will be enough for you to do the right thing, which was how he was supposed to now treat his former slave, now turned into a brother in Christ when he met Paul. But even this, this statement that acts through Revelation is too many books, is too soft of a statement because even in the Gospels, again, on nearly every page, Jesus is constantly teaching, commanding, correcting, or exemplifying the things that he wants his people to do. With the exception of the first couple of chapters of Matthew and Luke, which are the birth accounts, of course, and even they have some implied things, and with the exception of just the detailed account from the time that Jesus went to the cross until the moment when he died in all four Gospels, all the rest of them, all the rest of the sections of the Gospels even, have Jesus teaching, commanding, correcting, and giving us an example to follow, which he says that we must follow, that we are required to follow. Even the very ends of those books that often include what we call the Great Commission, that is a command. A commission is a command. 
where Jesus commands us to go out and to spread the gospel. We'll actually read a couple of those later because they are part of the basis for what we're going to be talking about. Just like the following books, the absolute truth of the matter is that on nearly every page of the New Testament, and again, if we have really large print, maybe every two or three pages of the New Testament, there is some command or teaching or example that we are told to follow. I truly wish that we had the time to fully cover and fully examine all of the requirements of the scriptures, especially of the New Testament. However, that would require us going at least in a pretty big survey through each book of the New Testament. So what we're going to do briefly for this next minute or two is we're going to mention some of the major categories and types of commands that we are given in the New Testament. We are commanded that we must believe and be baptized if we want to be saved, Mark 16, 16. Jesus flat out said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. This is a very important thing to remember because so many teach that nothing but belief is required. Yet Jesus said otherwise. We are commanded to then keep on obeying his words. Over in the same basic section, the way it was worded in Matthew is in Matthew 28, the last three verses, verses 18 through 20, where he came to his apostles and he said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples, or make people Christians, from all the nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I with you always, even to the end of the age. So if we want Jesus to be with us in our lives, we don't just obey the initial commands of belief and baptism, we must then keep on obeying all the things that he taught. We are even commanded how to worship God, and this is something that is often not even thought about in many churches today, but it should be. Just a brief summary is found wonderfully worded by Jesus in John 4, verse 24, where he said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Or in other words, both our inward way of worshiping as well as our outward actions must be correct according to his word. And there are plenty of verses in the New Testament that teach the details of the acts of worship, such as the Lord's Supper, or singing, or the teaching of the word, or the giving, or the praying. For that matter, in addition to the type of prayer that we are often taught to do about interceding on the behalf of others, or praying for our own needs, etc., we are commanded to do a specific kind of prayer on a regular basis. In 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9, this is written to those, by the way, who are already Christians. So what it says there is that we can indeed sin after we become Christians, unlike the teaching of some, and in fact, we must continually pray and confess those things to God in prayer if we want to stay right with him and stay forgiven and stay in a good relationship with him. The exact way it's worded in 1 John 1, 7 through 9 is, but if we walk or if we conduct ourselves in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continually cleanses us from our sins. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, in the original, it should be something like continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in general, we are often commanded simply to do the work of the Lord in our everyday lives. A good short, short version of that is in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, where Paul said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, these are just some of the major categories of the types of commands, of the many detailed commands and examples that we are given in the New Testament. And all of those individual commands that fall into these categories are also requirements and characteristics of true New Testament Christianity, which should tell us something. If we do not do them, then we don't love the Lord as much as we might think we do. We don't truly belong to him, and, or in other words, we are not truly saved. If that sounds too harsh or judgmental, don't worry. It does to many people. It even does to me coming out of my own mouth on one level. But on the other level, as I read through the New Testament, both in the English and in the original, I see it again on nearly every page. If we do feel it is too harsh and judgmental, then it's because we don't know the New Testament scriptures as well as we should. And so for the last handful of minutes that we're going to do this video, what I'm going to do is just list out just again a handful of the scriptures that say this general point. 
that if we don't obey, we don't love God, we are not right with him, we are not saved. And so John 14, 15, as usual, Jesus, the master teacher, worded it best, both simply and most directly. In John 14, 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Early in the history of the church, very early, the apostles were being persecuted just for preaching about Jesus. And in Acts 5, 29, while being questioned about it, interrogated about it, their response, it says there, was Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And I don't like to get bogged down in the language too much in these short videos, but ought literally should be now in more modern English. We must obey God rather than men, or we are required to obey God rather than men. Another great example is a picture of the Judgment Day. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, while Paul was actually writing to comfort and help the Thessalonians, who had been given all kinds of false teaching about the second coming of Christ and the Judgment Day, he said this in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, to give you who are troubled comfort with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, he'll in flaming fire take vengeance on those who do not know God and on those, notice, who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Hebrews 5, 9, again, the Hebrew writer is one who sometimes gets a little bit long-winded, but every now and then he comes up with a great one-liner. And in Hebrews 5, 9, it tells us that after Christ was completed his work, that he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. First John is a great example of this. We already mentioned earlier in chapter 1 how we're commanded to confess our sins to God in prayer if we want them continually forgiven. However, we're often told that First John is one of those books that tells us we can't sin after we're Christians, despite the fact that it did just say that, as we read a few minutes ago. But also we're often told that it's the book where it says that there's so much love in God that we don't have to worry about anything. Yet that's not what John actually says. He combines the love and the obedience of commands throughout the book. He says it in each chapter of the book in some way, shape, or form. But as he begins to draw his short letter of 1 John to a close, in 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, he summarizes the two points of love and obedience and draws them together as one overall living expression of our faith, of our obedience in Christ. In 1 John 5, 2 and 3, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And so we have to understand there that even in the books that seem, if we read through them too quickly, to say that love is all you need, or belief is all you need, or whatever, they often actually say, no, we are required to obey. But the reason they emphasize love or belief is because that's what those in the original audience were struggling with at that time. The great Sermon on the Mount, one of the greatest sermons, if not the greatest sermon ever preached by Jesus himself in this case, is in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And Jesus ended that sermon in Matthew 7, 21 through 27, with a specifically two different pictures or two different ways of showing that obedience is absolutely necessary to be part of his kingdom of God. And the first of those two, in verses 21 to 23, he says it two different ways. He says in 721, by, uh, or rather, not everyone who says to me or calls me Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That verse alone would be enough to drive the point home, hopefully. But then he goes on to say it's not just doing whatever we think is religious, but what he actually taught or actually gave us command or authority for. Because in verses 22 and 23, he said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied your name, cast out the demon's name, and done many wonderful works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, which literally is you who act without authority, or you who act without a command telling you to do it. So it's not just not doing anything it's, that's going to be punished. It's actually just not doing what exactly the Lord taught us and exemplified for us. And to even drive that point home, Jesus goes on to use an analogy, a metaphor, in verses 24 to 27. This one is known to almost every kid in Bible class eventually because this is the one about building the house on the rock versus the house on the sand. And in the first two verses, he tells us the good way of doing things. He says in verses 24 and 25 of Matthew 7, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings or teachings or commands of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. And then the other side. But whoever hears, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. So they still listen to the word, but they don't actually do it. Uh, them I will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Again, I can almost hear at least some of the protests from those who might watch the video where I've heard them so often in studying the Bible keep my lives, but I've been told that believing alone is enough, at least if we believe strongly enough, or at least if we pray to God with that belief, or ask God into our hearts, or some version of that, none of which, by the way, is actually found in the New Testament. Here's an interesting fact, though, that should drive this point home, and this will be the last specific scripture that we turn to, James chapter 2. Did you know that the only times, especially in the original Greek, because some translations change the words around, but did you know that in the original Greek, the only time that the words faith and only are found in the same sentence is when we're told that we are not justified or made right with God or saved by faith alone, by belief alone. Well, it's a kind of a long section, but we'll go through it a little bit quickly because there is a lot going on there. In James 2, verse 14 through the end, we see this. James making this point, what does it profit, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works or obedience? Can faith alone, in other words, but it doesn't say alone, can faith save him? If a brother or a sister is ne naked and destitute of their daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things that they need for their body, what does it profit? Thus also by faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone may say, if you have faith and I have works, James answers, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well, but the demons also believe and tremble. Do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified, or again, made right or saved by works, when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete? Or in other words, our faith, if it's just inner belief alone, is not actually complete until we do the things we are commanded. And he said, then the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. And here's the key verse. You see then that a man is justified, or made right, or saved by works, and not by faith only. And he says it again a sentence later in verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Again, this was hopefully a powerful but brief, short overview of the concept that we must obey the commands and the examples given to us in the scripture. Hopefully we've all begun to realize that despite the very popular view among many denominations and false religions today, that the Lord's word actually clearly states that active obedience is required by the Lord. And hopefully when we realize that, we will be motivated to look into it, to search the scriptures, to study them, and to see it for ourselves, and not just the concept, but the overall details of the commands that we are given in the Lord. And that hopefully when we see that, we will happily actually start to do them in our lives. Thank you for listening. And if you have any spiritual need, please feel free to contact us here at the Central Church of Christ in Columbia, Kentucky.